Hello there again, everyone. It's Christy, and it's time to continue on with How to Social Science. This time we're doing 201, and that's because the philosophy that I wanted to cover in 101 is, is done now, and the rest of this is going to be broken into two streams. The 201 course is going to focus on qualitative research methods, data analysis, and interpreting findings. The second side, 202, is going to focus on the quantitative side. Today we're starting with qualitative research design, so let's get going. Before we start, I'm going to provide very clear use of terms so that as I won't create confusion in the future. When I talk about the phrase research design, what I mean by that is the entire research process, from developing your research question right through to doing your data collection, doing your data analysis, and publishing your findings. When I say the, the study design, that's when I'm referring to the specifics of the data collection itself. That might be, you know, um, uh, focus groups, or it might be interviews, or it might be an ethnography. So when you design your ethnography, and in particular, particular you want to look at where are you going to be doing your research, what kinds of people are you going to be talking to, what kinds of textual or verbal data will you be collecting, all of that focus on the data collection itself is the study design. But when I talk about research design, I'm again talking about from start to finish. When starting your qualitative research project, it might be very tempting to treat it in the similar, similar to the linear process of writing an essay, or even with quantitative research, that you state your research question, you investigate your literature more deeply, and read around it, identify gaps in the literature that need to be addressed, you would then develop an idea of what you would find in the data based on the theory, collect your data, analyze your data, and report your findings. That's not exactly how research tends to go in qualitative because of its iterative and inductive nature. Qualitative research is data-led, not only theory-led. And theories are formulated in the field, not just in the library. Our aim in Qualitative research is not to reduce complex systems into simple deductive theoretical statements. Instead, it's to actually take into account that complexity when we're doing our research. When you're doing quantitative research, you have to ask the question in the same way to the same people over time because you have to show that you're measuring the same concept, you're applying the state, same stimulus. Therefore, if you ask one person, do you have trust in your government? and another person, do you have confidence in your government, you're going to have to spend some time in your paper explaining why trust and confidence are really measuring the same thing and not two different things because you use two different words. Now in qualitative research, you have to partially suspend your a priori, a priori theoretical knowledge in order to be open to new patterns or new conceptual themes that emerge. And in this way, qualitatively, you avoid theoretical tunnel vision that prevents you from seeing patterns that exist in the data. There are systematic methods that people can use to discover new conceptual relations or new patterns in qualitative data. One of them is grounded theory, and we're going to be looking at this in a later lecture. I'm going to quote here from Glasier and Strauss, who said, Theoretical sampling is the process of data collection for generating theory whereby the analyst jointly collects, codes, and analyzes his data and decides what data to collect next and where to find them in order to develop his theory as it emerges. This process of data collection is controlled by the emerging theory. That's to say that when you discover something that seems to be interesting in your data, you go out and collect more data to see whether or not the pattern is really out there and you can observe it in other situations or if it was just the consequence of your one observation. But this is the idea of refining your ideas and going back to the world to make more observations than reflecting and then refining your question and going back to the world to make more observations. This is very much how a lot of qualitative research is done. Within the sort of theoretical saturation sampling framework, you can therefore focus on specific groups and specific individuals. Qualitative research is not intended to be representative in the same way that quantitative research is designed to be, because you're gathering data on these individuals because you think there is something to be found and a theory to be developed. This leads to questions such as what groups does one turn to next in the data collection and for what theoretical purposes. The criteria for sampling must be based on your theoretical considerations, 
not the representativeness of the sample. In quantitative research, the number of cases you gather will, if you gather it properly with a randomized sample or a stratified randomized sample, this allows you to calculate a margin of error or a confidence interval. For instance, you will often see these sorts of things reported at the ends of surveys. Results are based on telephone interviews with 1,521 national adults aged 18 and older conducted between October 16th and 19th, 2009. For results based on this sample of national adults, the maximum margin of error is plus or minus three percentage points. And there are statistical means and reasons why we assign those sorts of margins of error in quantitative research. Now in qualitative research, we don't have confidence intervals or statistical methods for determining how large or small of the sample size should be. How do you decide? You decide when you reach theoretical saturation. So your investigation as a qualitative researcher is led by the data. And when you, I, the, the point at which you know that you don't have to collect any more data is that when you go to collect more data, no new information is being found. By the end of the Qualitative Election Study of Britain, after I've run about 14 focus groups, it doesn't seem to matter if I'm in England, Scotland, or Wales, I know what people are going to say, because I've spent the last six weeks um, in hours and hours of focus group listening to almost 100 people, and I've, I've got to the point where I've de identified the patterns that are repeatedly coming up, and there's no new information coming up in the focus groups. That's the point of theoretical saturation. In qualitative research design, when you are formulating your research question, it can be changed or refined over the course of your data collection, and you should be open to this. You should be open to becoming more specific and narrowly focused, or alternatively, to realize that you've left some information out and redefine your concept to be open to new data. Try to formulate a specific research question with concrete terms and develop a very clear idea of where your data will come from. If you have a very vague and undeveloped research question, you'll become more confused when you're confronted with mountains of data. If you have a very specific idea of what you, the, you know, the concept that you have in mind, then you'll be able to precisely identify it even when it appears, when someone says something in a way that you don't expect, because you have a very precise understanding of the concept that you're dealing with. You'll be able to ident identify and recognize the potential contribution to your data that person can contribute. As with quantitative data, if you ask a five-point scale, if you ask someone to answer from strongly agree to strongly disagree, this limits the kind of data analysis you can do. If you ask someone an interval level question to rate on a scale of 100, that also will influence the kind of analysis you can do. It's the same thing with qualitative research as well. When you ask people questions, you need to think about how you're going to be analyzing the data on the other side. If you're going to be using grounded theory method to be doing open coding, then you'll want questions that you know, allow for the production of data that allow you to do that thick, rich, review that thick, rich description and do very you know, um, well-documented coding, very in-depth coding of that data. And you should always think about the form of data analysis at the same time as you're thinking about developing your research questions. So how you phrase your question, whether it's a brainstorming exercise, whether you're looking at text in a, in a memo that's been handed around an office in a campaign or um, some sort of you know, um, activist group that you're embedded in, these kinds of data will need to be analyzed and instead of just, just blindingly gathering data. It is important to think strategically about the methods of analysis that you're going to be applying to the data that you collect. You remember the slide perhaps from the philosophy of social science that with qualitative research, it's more of an iterative process of going back to the data, refining your questions, going back to the data, and then writing up your research results and findings at the end. The circular nature of qualitative data means that collection can be extended over a period of time that questions can be refined, new concepts can be identified and filled out. It also means you'll need to collect and analyze a significant amount of data in order to substantiate your claims. For instance, one person using a concept in your data set is not sufficient. When you're going to be coding your data, it's also, just like it's important to have a clear question, it's also important to have a clear understanding of what exactly it is you want to do analysis on. What units of analysis are you expecting to see in your data? 
Are you looking to describe states of being or the way things are? Or are you looking at processes of change over time? And just a few examples of things that qualitative data can be investigated to unpack are things like how people describe meaning, what practices people engage in and why, a specific episode in an, an organization's history, people's encounters with each other, the roles that people take on in an organization, relationships between people, how groups behave, how organizations behave, or how lifestyles are constructed. All of these are th things that you know you could investigate, but the more precise you are about what you want to, what your unit of analysis is, the more precise your analysis at the end of the data collection will be. Laughlin and Laughlin give some advice on ways to think about the topic that you're interested in investigating. And here is here are some questions that might help you unpack that question. What type of phenomenon are you looking at? What is its structure? How frequent is it? What are the causes? What are the processes? What are its consequences? And what are people's strategies? These are all ways to get you thinking around your own question to be more open to the kinds of data that you're going to encounter. I'm going to wrap that up here because the next section deals with specific modes of data collection. And that's a nice big bulk of you know, slides that probably do best if they're done together. Next time, we're going to be looking at the quantitative side of how to social science. And in particular, we're going to be looking at content analysis and the introduction to data analysis. So that's what's up in the next lecture in the 202 series. This has been How to Social Science 201 on the qual side. I've been Christy. You've been awesome. Thanks for your time and attention. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye.